Thank you. Um, it is wonderful to be here. We, um, we love um, Central and we love you guys. So it's just such an honor um, to be able to speak, albeit down a camera and not out here. Occasionally, I'll look there to where you guys are. Um, I want um, to talk to you today about um, turning doubt into peace. Uh, turning doubt into peace, and I'm not going to. I don't want to talk about that kind of the existential doubt that uh, people kind of we're all supposed to wrestle with. You know, is there a God out there and all that kind of thing. But I'm I'm talking about the kind of doubt that most people experience, and the and the reason for most doubt in people's life, which is the doubt that's based on the experience and the stuff of life. And um, I find that most of my doubts and most of the doubts I deal with other people don't come out of like big philosophical questions. They come out of what has happened to me in my life and um, those times when a gap you know a gap opens up between maybe the expectations I had about what life was going to be like or what life and faith would be like and how it seems to be playing out um, especially those kind of doubts that come as a result of you having maybe chosen the you know the right path uh, I took this decision it felt like the right thing to do it felt like the Lord was in it and now it just seems to be trouble upon trouble and um, maybe um, as you're watching, it's that sense of um, that relationship that you've been waiting for and that hasn't yet come about. Or maybe it's a choice you made that was kind of a real kind of gospel choice around work and it does not seem to have worked out. It seems actually you've made things more difficult or you've watched other people get what you thought you could have got. Or maybe um, that real sense for calling from the Lord uh, and you followed him into something and it feels like... Uh, that it's been nothing but misery. Um, and when you look around, everybody else seems to be doing just fine. It might just be me I'm speaking to this morning, so thank you very much for allowing me to talk to myself. Um, but it's that kind of doubt I'm talking about. And I want to talk about how that doubt is not something that we have to live with, but it can be replaced with peace. We're in Psalm 73, which I'm going to read for us. So that's Psalm 73. So wherever you are, grab your Bibles, open them up. And let's listen to Psalm 73. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold. For I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from common human burdens. They are not plagued by human ills. Therefore, pride is their necklace. They clothe themselves with violence. From their callous hearts come iniquity. Their evil imaginations have no limits. They scoff and speak with malice. With arrogance, they threaten oppression. Their mouths lay claim to heaven and their tongues take possession of the earth. Therefore, their people turn to them and drink up waters in abundance. They say, how would God know? Does the Most High know anything? This is what the wicked are like, always free of care. They go on amassing wealth. Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure and have washed my hands in innocence. All day long I have been afflicted and every morning brings new punishments. If I had spoken out like that, you would have, I would have betrayed your children. When I tried to understand all this, it troubled me deeply. Till I entered the sanctuary of God, then I understood their final destiny. Surely you place them on slippery ground, you cast them down to ruin. How suddenly are they destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. They are like a dream when one awakes. When you arise, Lord, you will despise them as fantasies. When my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, I was senseless and ignorant. I was a brute beast before you, yet I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will take me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Those who are far from you will perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of all your deeds. This is the word of the Lord. I hope you're all saying thanks be to God where you are. 
Um, there are four things I want us um, to think about from this psalm. Um, two things, uh, two aspects that cause us to doubt. Um, what we need to do, and then a reminder about how all this is made possible. So two aspects that cause us to doubt, what we need to do, and a reminder of how all this is possible. Um, the first one is this, is doubts arise uh, when we look around and not up. Our doubts arise when we look around and not up. Um, with the psalmist, it's very clear that his focus has been on the wicked and on others. And when I compare myself to others and how I perceive that their lives are going, um, I find myself doubting. The psalmist opens with a statement of great faith. Um, Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But then what I love is the honesty where he says, but as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold. And he tells us why. It's because I've been looking at the lives of the wicked. And he measures his life compares, compared to how he sees the life of the wicked going. He's taken the high ground. And surely in vain I've kept my heart pure. But he is wondering, was it worth it? Um, I've made a decision, but based on what I see, was it a good one? Um, it's all too easy for us to do the same. Uh, to base our sense of how life is, how we are, on how we see others and measuring ourselves to others. It's interesting enough, it's how we're wired. So there's, there's, a, there's a truth in this, in that our identity is found not in ourselves alone, but in relationship to other. Our identity is found not in ourselves alone, but in how we relate to others. And we know this in the world around us. I've just finished reading um, the new novel by um, the English-Japanese author Kazuro Ishiguro called Clara and the Sun. It's definitely worth reading. But there's this wonderful moment where um, towards the end of the novel you realize that what he is saying is that, that what truly matters in life is to love um, and that you can only really truly be loved in a relationship that gives and receives from others. Uh, that, that you can't be defined by yourself alone or by what is inside you but in how you are for others and how others have loved you. Now we were made to be in relationship with God. And we were made to find our sense of identity, our sense of worth, our sense of who we are in our relationship to our Heavenly Father. And just because we walked away from it doesn't stop that design in us, needing others to help us secure ourselves. And so out there, in all the world, everybody's trying to work out who they are, and the only way they can do it is by looking somewhere else and at someone else. And so we find ourselves constantly looking at the lives of others and seeing how we measure up. Sometimes we do it to make ourselves feel bad. They're doing so much better than me. Um, I find that, um, being a vicar, this is not for the violins, but being a vicar, I don't earn, uh, I earn quite, I, I, I earn well but I don't earn as much as some of the people I went to university with. And I'm generally, I'm okay with that until I, go to get, until I go and visit their houses. And then I'm like, you know, and my kids say things like, this is like a grand design house. I'm like, no kids, it's just like a normal house that people who don't live in a vicarage live in. Um, but, but I find myself suddenly going to like measuring my life up against people I, I knew from university because um, I'm exposed to them and their life. We do it all the time. We get this sense of self from others and sometimes we do it to make ourselves um, feel less. Other times, we do it to make ourselves feel better. We go, ah, well, at least, you know, I don't have uh, the Grand Designs house, but I've got this, and I'm not that person. We're constantly jockeying for position. We're looking around, and we're not looking up. We're looking around, and we're not looking up. It's the first mistake we make. Doubts arise when we look around and we don't look up to God. I wonder um, how you do at looking around. I wonder how often when you look around at others, it's not to bless or to receive blessing, but it's to measure. I wonder how you're doing at looking up to the relationship that you were made for and the only relationship that can truly define you. It's the first thing that we do 
uh, that causes doubt is we look around, not up. The second thing is um, we value now and not eternity. We value now and not eternity. You can see the psalmist, he's looked around at everybody else, and then he also looks and sees what they have. And our doubts arise when we see the blessings that others have that we feel that we lack. The promotion at work, um, the happy home life, um, the great holidays, whatever it might be. But when we see the blessings of others' lives and the paucity of ours. And in the world um, of the Bible, a sign that you were kind of blessed by your God, whether it, um, whatever religion you were from, like your local God, your local deity, was actually the blessings of your life. And in our world out here, uh, the sign of how good you are is, again, the, the blessings of your life. And again, in, in the same way, that the tr there's a little bit of truth that we've kind of perverted in the same way that we did with the other one, when the truth was that we need another to define us. Um, the truth that we've perverted here is that actually life... Life is a blessed one. Life is we have called, we are invited into a life that is full of blessing. But we look at it now and not in the scope of eternity. We look at a small picture and not a big picture. It, it's almost like, um, it's almost like quite often when you, when, uh, this is what I do. If I, if I, if I see someone else and I, I kind of like take a snapshot of their life and then I hold it up compared to my life, and what I do is I hold up a snapshot that I've taken and I compare it to the whole of my life backwards and actually how I plan it forward. And so therefore I then go, this person, this, this, this and this, me, not that and probably not moving forward. And all I've done is taken a snapshot of a now. I don't know what their lives were like up to that point. I don't really know what their lives are going to be like. I don't at all know what their lives are going to be like and from that point. And actually, interesting enough, I don't really know what their lives are like now. But I've looked at what I think they have. And then I've held it up against what I haven't got, and I've felt sad, and I've let doubt creep in. We value in our world what we can measure. But interestingly enough, the stuff that really values, the stuff that we carry on, the stuff that we... Um, there will be great things about the past year that you will remember in the future. And it won't be physical things. It'll be moments. It'll be um, times when you suddenly found yourself laughing or crying or, or times when you connected with people. We value all the wrong stuff. So doubts arise um, when we measure, when we value what we can measure and not the big picture. And the big picture is eternity. And what the psalmist does is ends up rooting their response in eternity and seeing that actually it's not worth a snapshot, but it's worth looking at the bigger picture. What do you value? What do you measure? Is it just a snapshot or is it something bigger? So there were the kind of two things that struck me that um, the psalmist is, is struggling with, which is causing um, his feet to almost slip. He's looking around, he's measuring himself against other people. And he's looking around and he's looking at what they have and what he doesn't have. And he's wondering if it was all worth it. How does he solve it? Well, Look at verse 17. He recognizes up till verse 17 that he's been looking at the wicked and all they've got. He actually recognizes that his feet had almost slipped. I mean, 15 and 16, he, he recognizes that he's been kind of betraying some truth of God, uh, that he couldn't understand it. And then in verse 17, he says this, till I entered the sanctuary of God, then I understood their final destiny. Till I entered the sanctuary of God. Encounters with God change how we see others and change how we see this world and therefore change how we see ourselves. Encounters with God change us. And the truth about God is not something that the psalmist has kind of like, he's not opened up um, an ancient Near East equivalent of, you know, um, 
X amount of principles to deal with living around the wicked and said, I must read these and then learn them and, and, you know, and think about putting them into practice. He's gone to the house of the Lord and he's met with God. And the truths about God um, don't land outside of an experience with God. The truths about God don't land without encountering God. Our Christian faith is not something that, it's not a list of things that we, we try and apply. It's a relationship with the God who loves us. And it's in those places of encounter that truths that we might really hard try and assent here explode into our hearts and out into our lives. It's an encountering God. I realize, oh, I've been looking around. I haven't been looking up. I've been getting my sense of who I am from others, not from you. It's an encountering God. I realize I've got eternity ahead of me. I've got you with me now. Why do I want bifold doors? A man who taught me um, what's called patristic theology, which is the theology of the kind of very early church, Roman Catholic theologian, uh, a lovely American guy called Tom Wynandy, um, said this about the doctrine of the Trinity. He, 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 said, I, he said, nobody understands the doctrine of the Trinity until they're baptized in the Holy Spirit. He said, I didn't get it until I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. And what he meant by that was, you can tell me that God is three and God is one, but actually until I encounter God in his oneness and his threeness, I won't get it. And that's what the psalmist is going, that's what's going on for the psalmist here, is, is when he goes to the temple, when he goes to where God is, everything changes. He realizes um, that his heart was grieved that his spirit was embittered, verse 21. He realizes he was senseless and ignorant and that he was like a brute beast. And that's repentance. And God invites us in his kindness to repent. And then out of that, he realizes that, hold on a second, I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. You're going to take me into glory. And then as he looks around at everybody else and all they've got, he says this, whom have I in heaven but you? And the earth has nothing I desire besides you. He couldn't say that before he went to the place of the Lord. And when he met with the Lord, he could. Friends, we need to take our doubts to God. We need to go where he is. We need to meet with him. And we need to let him change us. So the experience of life causes us to doubt when we look around at others, when we look at what we can measure. And those doubts get washed away in the presence of God when we look at him and we measure eternity. And how is all this made possible? It's the Sunday school answer. It is made possible in Jesus. Jesus is the only one of us who's come and who's lived a life um, totally looking at others in the right way, taking his sense of identity fully from his heavenly father. He's the only one who's come and is, can 100% say, I didn't measure the stuff of this world, but I measured in eternity. I valued in eternity. And yet he exchanged all of our measuring ourselves against others and measuring the stuff of this life for him, for his doing it properly. Yet I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You guide me with your counsel. Afterwards, you will take me into glory. As the creed says, he descended to the dead. My flat and harsh may fail. But God is the strength of my heart, my portion forever. His heart failed so that we could have a new one for eternity. Those who are far from you will perish. You destroy all those who are unfaithful to you. The only one who was close, 100% to him. The only one who was faithful, 100% perished so that you and I don't have to and we can experience God. And with Jesus, we can say, as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of all your deeds. What's happening 
in our culture at the moment, um, and this is this is good, is is that COVID is basically exploding all the places um, in our lives and in the world around us um, where we've been doing things wrong, where we've been um, identifying ourselves with others wrongly, where we've been measuring what we value wrongly. And what's scaring a lot of people at the moment is things that looked really, really strong are just crumbling. Outside my last house was a wall that was about 10 foot high and about three foot wide, uh, made out of absolutely massive stones. Um, we used to get up and used to clamber along it. Um, and on one side was the road to, um, was the, if you're on the road, the wall was about here, but if you went the other side of the road, it was up there. You know, you, you get, the, get the picture. And, um, and one day, a car came around the corner, guy put on his brakes um, and went into the wall. And in the end, he went into the wall really, really slowly. But he went into the wall and the whole thing, luckily our car wasn't there because he was normally parked on the wall, but the whole thing just came down. And we were like, oh my word, I thought that wall was really, really strong. And actually the wall wasn't very strong at all. It was probably been there about 100 years. The mortar had all gone. There was loads of earth and the weeds and everything all the way through it. And all it required was a... And the whole thing came crashing down. That's happening in culture. It's probably also happening a little bit in your heart as well in this past year. And our culture is longing for there to be another way to rebuild that wall. And we know that there is, that it's in Jesus. That as our culture doubts um, who they are as they look at others, our doubts what they value as they see it either taken away or not happening, that we have an opportunity to present to them the one who has changed us the one who has taken our doubt and filled us with peace. In this life, you will have troubles. And in this life, you will have doubt. The question is, will we go to the place of the Lord, meet with him, and be changed? Let's pray. Um. So let's just where we are, um, let's just invite the Lord into, um, into our hearts and into our minds. It might be, um, you know, if you were in church, I'd say put out your hand. So where you are now, just put out your hands as a sign that you want to receive. And we simply pray, come, Holy Spirit. We wait on you. I think the Lord wants to um, minister to those of us who, who like struggle to get beyond verse 2. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I'd nearly lost my foothold. And I think the Lord just wants you to invite him in uh, to welcome his presence. If you're responding to that, it might be that you want to do what the psalmist says later on. Just, just literally just hold out your right hand towards, uh, out in front of you and just say, Lord, you hold me by my right hand. And then for, for any of us who feel wronged, the psalmist felt wronged. If you felt wronged, I think the Lord wants to invite you in, into repentance and then into encounter.
And then I think there's just a few people as you watch this, you're thinking about decisions you've made and, and that phrase in vain really means something to you. And I just think he would say no. The kingdom, nothing is in vain. And just as you turn to him, just allow him to remind you of um, moments, things that have happened that show that you've taken the right path, that you're following him.